Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 299 of the podcast. It's the 12th of October, 2021, as I record this intro. So, for a few weeks now, I've been thinking about what I'd like to do to mark the milestone of 300 episodes. Maybe an interesting compilation episode, maybe a solo episode, something. Well, last week, I started pulling together some thoughts and clips, but it didn't feel quite right for this. And I'm sure I'll finish that up in the future. But I still love the title that I had in mind, In Celebration of Unschooling, so I wanted to keep that. And then something else came to mind. Earlier this year, I came across a draft of a book I wrote back in 2015 and 2016, completely reorganizing it three times before putting it on the back burner to simmer and shifting my focus to writing The Unschooling Journey, which came out in 2018. This book was written through the lens of parenting and with an audience curious about unschooling in mind, but not necessarily having yet made the leap. And I was trying to connect ideas I'd come across out in the world that, unbeknownst to the authors, resonated well with unschooling. So trying to meet parents there and share what I'd learned over the years about unschooling. I'm spending most of my time right now focused on the podcast and the Living Joyfully Network community, and I'm loving that. So I don't know when or even if I'll dive back into that book, play with it some more, work with an editor, and eventually publish it. Yet there are ideas and connections in it that I'd like to share. And this podcast milestone seems like a fitting opportunity in which to do that. (laughs) So this book has also changed titles quite a few times. From free to think, to the art of unschooling, to the art of parenting, to the art of being a parent. But you know what? In celebration of unschooling feels really good for it right now. So that was a really long way to say over the next few weeks of the podcast, I'm going to be sharing the book with you. The hook, the build, the twist, the payoff. And even if you're not smack in the middle of the intended audience, as you have heard me say many times before, I think you can still get a lot out of it. It might help remind you and reground you in why you've chosen unschooling for your family. And that often helps us stay more fully in the moment with our children. Maybe it'll spark some new connections, help you understand and appreciate the beauty of unschooling more deeply which in turn may bring new possibilities to your family's days. Well, let's find out. I hope you enjoy accompanying me on the ride. And of course, before we dive in, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Some of you have been supporting the podcast since the beginning. I just took a peek and I started on Patreon in November 2016, so five years next month. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Others have joined in just the last few weeks. Thank you too. I appreciate you. And of course, thanks so much to everyone who has scattered beautifully in that spectrum of time. I truly couldn't keep doing this without you. Your generous support pays for the hosting and the transcription and contributes to the time I spend creating new episodes each week. It's instrumental in keeping the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now let's dive into the mix. Introduction. I knew that my children not going to school was unconventional, but still, I was surprised at how often people were genuinely bewildered by us. I still remember being huddled with the other moms around my daughter's girl guide leader when she asked us whether, if our daughters became upset at camp, she should call us or tell them to stick it out. 
I waited for the chorus of Stick It Out to die down and replied, Call me. Everyone turned to look at me like I had two heads. Then there was the mystified look on the scout leader's face when I mentioned that my seven-year-old son had considered participating last year, but decided against it. How about the girl who, after meeting my then 12-year-old daughter, ran up to me wide-eyed and asked incredulously, you really don't want her to go to school? Or the strange looks a group of young teens shot my daughter when, at age 14, she called her younger brother over for a goodbye hug. I definitely noticed the pointed double take from the pediatric ward nurse when she asked me a care-related question and I replied, I'm not sure, what do you think? Redirecting the question to my then 11-year-old son, the patient lying in the foot, in the bed a foot away. I admit I laughed when my daughter described the look of utter shock and confusion on a volunteer's face when she explained that she was homeschooled. So she wasn't volunteering at the thrift store to complete the required high school community service hours, but because she wanted to help. We were like aliens walking among them. How did that happen? (laughs) I suspect it started when I first had kids, but it became so much more pronounced as we dove deeper into unschooling. I began to see my parenting role not as teaching my children how to act like adults, but as helping them be the children they wanted to be. And I came to realize that children naturally grow up. I couldn't stop it if I wanted to. They want to explore the world of adults. They want to understand the world of adults. They want to engage with the world of adults, with the real world. That is what unschooling is about, living and learning in the world rather than being sequestered away for 12 or more years of adult training before they're finally released. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In this book, I want to take you on an expedition to explore some of the fascinating things I learned about parenting, learning, childhood, and being human through unschooling my three children for more than a decade. And I hope that by the end, we won't look quite so alien. What will our journey look like? Our first stop will be to look a bit more closely at unschooling. What makes it so different? Why is it so hard to describe unschooling to others? Does knowing more information necessarily enrich our understanding of the world? How does the conventional wisdom about child development hold up? Next, in chapter two, we'll dig into our parenting mindset by looking at some of the conventional beliefs about parenting we were handed and seeing how they hold up today. How well does viewing parenting as an 18-year project to mold a baby into a finished adult really serve us? How does our definition of success influence our parenting choices? Can we really teach character? These are important fundamental questions to ask ourselves. And the answers will help us get a better handle on where we'd like our parenting expedition to go. The fun thing is our destination isn't carved in stone as long as we keep an open mind. In chapter three, we'll explore curiosity. Humans are wired to be curious. We see it in babies with their determination to lift their head, roll over, and pick up a toy. We see it in toddlers with their insatiable drive to open the kitchen cupboards, unravel the toilet paper, and climb the stairs. It's also highly prized in adults, driving them to find answers to the questions that intrigue them, often benefiting the rest of us along the way. But what about those intervening years? Curiosity is often discouraged at school because it takes children's attention away from the curricula they are expected to follow, and at home because it gets messy. We'll bring unschooling into the picture, which, at its most basic, is learning without a curriculum. It's simple enough in concept, but it can be hard to envision in practice. Without a curriculum to follow, what do children do instead? We'll consider how curiosity can shape a remarkably personalized and effective course of learning, if choice is an integral part of their days. The framework of compulsory school years deeply ingrains in children and adults the idea of a start and end to learning. But without that fencing, curiosity naturally inspires lifelong learning. On our next stop, Chapter 4, we'll take an in-depth look at the act of learning itself. 
Here's where things get really interesting. We're going to explore the definition of learning and the slew of ways people learn, how the classroom environment teaches children that learning is hard, the value of allowing learning to unfold at the child's pace and the crucial role of patience, how passions of any ilk are a window to the world rather than the confined and limiting box we often imagine, and how intrinsic motivation helps children stick with things even when they get challenging. And then, with this bigger picture of curiosity and learning, in Chapter 5, we'll tackle creativity. What kinds of thinking are involved in creativity? Why do unschooling parents treasure free, unstructured time? We'll also dig into the impact of judgment and shame and the lifelong value of a creative approach to both work and play, to life. In Chapter 6, our parenting expedition continues with character. We'll explore traits such as self-awareness, empathy, and trust, and the value they have in our lives. We'll also examine how the unschooling lifestyle actively supports character development, rather than telling our children over and over how we expect them to behave. One of the key tenets of unschooling is that we're not trying to mold our children into some picture we hold in our minds of the perfect child. We are supporting our children as they discover who they are and explore the person they want to become. Which leads us into chapter seven, where we'll dig into family. What does life look like in an unschooling family? How do we develop and maintain strong and connected relationships? What about sibling rivalry? How do we handle the teen years? Is it possible to have a joyful approach to our days without ignoring reality? Here's where I think many of the alien-related questions will be answered. Unschooling really is a different way of living, but once we arrive at this point on our journey, I think it will begin to make sense. And then in Chapter 8, we'll take our new understanding of childhood, of curiosity and learning and creativity, of intrinsic motivation and character, and look back at school with fresh eyes. If school is a part of your lives for one reason or another, are there ways to weave it into your family's lives without it taking over? What might life look like if you choose not to perpetuate school's approach at home? Your house isn't filled with 30-odd kids to manage. How has your perspective changed now that you more clearly see that school is a choice? The education system can be a tool the parents use to supplement their children's learning. It needn't control it. In no way does it, nor should it, represent all their learning. What if school happens at school and outside of the classroom, children are actively engaged in life? This book is an exploration of the most fascinating things I learned about parenting children and life through unschooling my three kids. Backed up by observations from hundreds, if not thousands, of other unschooling families who generously share their unschooling experiences. But I'm not here to convince you one way or another. I'm here to encourage you to think for yourself. As you read or listen to this book, recall your experiences as a child, at school, at home, at your favorite activities and haunts. How do they mesh with the ideas you're reading here? Watch your own children in action. Do you catch glimpses of unbridled enthusiasm and learning? And even if you don't end up choosing unschooling, I hope you'll find some useful and joyful ideas to bring to your family's days. And that when you're finished reading, we don't look quite so alien anymore. Chapter one, what is unschooling? You know how they say, don't read the comments on the internet? I read the comments. I wasn't interviewed for this particular magazine's online article about unschooling, but I knew some of the people who were. As I read it, I felt the sincerity and the joy in their quoted words. They nailed some key ideas, yet the article only scratched the surface. And the comments weren't pretty, though I understood where they were coming from, too. Unschooling is very different from the conventional childhood lifestyle of school, homework, and organized extracurricular activities, which means it attracts attention, sometimes vitriolic attention. Come back to school time, the unschooling community inevitably feels a wave of urgent interview requests from journalists who have been assigned the, quote, unschooling story. They are looking to speak with parents, maybe spend a couple of hours with a family to see what unschooling looks like. 
Having participated in a number of these interviews over the years, I know they are most often well-intentioned on both sides, with the families doing their best to share their unschooling experience and the journalists doing their best to make some sense of it all. The resulting article, though, is most often a hollow shell of unschooling, basically an unorthodox to-do list. No curriculum, no rules, learn whatever they want. Any attempt to explain the reasoning behind those choices remains superficial. After seeing this pattern play out again and again, I began to wonder why. What gets in the way of succinctly communicating how this learning-centered lifestyle works? In the end, I think it boils down to a fundamental difference in perspectives. We are practically worlds apart. With the tight deadlines inherent in reporting, there just isn't enough time to take journalists on the comprehensive years-long journey through which we have developed this new perspective on children and learning. It's a journey that brings deeper shades of meaning to our words, meaning that just isn't there for those who are reading them through a more conventional lens. Let's take the idea that unschooling children learn whenever they want. When unschooling parents use that phrase, in their mind, they see their children's enthusiastic and intense learning as they follow their interests and explore their world. Contrast that with conventional readers who are more likely to read that phrase, learn whatever they want, and envision anarchy, kids left alone to flounder and fail because in their experience, no child wants to learn. See? Worlds apart. Let's dig a bit deeper and just take the word learn. Over the last few decades, the educational system's increased focus on curricularization, breaking down topics into discrete chunks to teach, and standardized testing has severely narrowed the definition of learning. Curricula is now considered the definition of what is important to learn, devaluing the world outside the classroom. Listening to a teacher explain and completing worksheets for practice is considered the best way to learn, devaluing the many other ways there are to develop knowledge and skills. And testing is considered the standard for measuring learning, devaluing long-term understanding. A test score remains in a student's record, even if the content itself fades from their memory. Take a moment to think back on the many tests you took in your own school career. If you took the same test a month later, would you have done as well? Often, I would not have. (laughs) This disconnect is even more apparent after school vacations. In recent years, the term coined to describe this phenomenon is summer learning loss. They blame the student for forgetting, but it's how memory works. The more often information is used by a person, the better chance it will end up in their long-term memory. That's why studying helps students retain information long enough to recall it for a test, but soon after, when they stop using it because it doesn't apply to their daily lives, it fades. When unschooling parents talk about learning, they mean something very different. What unschooling children learn isn't limited to what's in the curricula, and how they learn isn't limited to being taught by a teacher. With unschooling, learning is a less linear, but often more concrete process that aligns with how human memory works. It also looks the same for children and adults. A person engages in something they're interested in and seeks out more information, so it's more likely they will continue to use that information regularly. They examine it from different angles, increasing their understanding, and connect it to related pieces of information they already know solidifying it in long-term memory. Like toddlers learning to walk and talk, like adults immersing themselves in their favorite hobby, unschooling children gather knowledge and skills and weave them together to make sense of the world around them. Maria Popova, the curator of brainpickings.com, elegantly, if unknowingly, describes the contrast between conventional and unschooling approaches to learning in her essay, Wisdom in the Age of Information, and the Importance of Storytelling in Making Sense of the World. She wrote, We live in a world awash with information, but we seem to face a growing scarcity of wisdom. What's worse, we confuse the two. 
We believe that having access to more information produces more knowledge, which results in more wisdom. But if anything, the opposite is true. More and more information without the proper context and interpretation only muddles our understanding of the world rather than enriching it. Unschooling parents value the context and connections that surround a piece of information and cultivate a learning environment for their children where the why and the how are just as important as the what. We share our understanding and experiences with our children in the context of both their interests and the moment. And when needed, we help our children find resources that help extend their understanding beyond our own. That is the learning process we are describing when we say our children learn whatever they want. <laughs> so now let's dig into another word in that phrase. You thought we were done. Want. The conventional reader's understandable reaction is often, that might work for you, but my child would never want to learn anything. And this assertion makes sense from their perspective because they are working with that narrow definition of learning where, quote, anything means anything in a curriculum. And learn means taught by a teacher. The behavior unschooling parents are describing of children wanting to learn things and enjoying the process seems impossibly strange, alien to most readers. But the reality is conventional beliefs about children are based on observations made and studies done on children who go to school. Children whose lives are closely controlled by adults. What unschooling parents have found is that children who are active participants in choosing how their day-to-day -day lives unfold are almost a different species. It turns out children are people. <laughs> what I mean is they are not underdeveloped adults in training. The idea that they are best served by spending a good chunk of their childhood in schools being taught and tested on a standard set of knowledge and skills before finally graduating into the real world just doesn't hold up. Children are already capable of exploring their world, gathering information, connecting it to their existing knowledge to build their understanding, incorporating their experiences and feeding all that back into their choices moving forward. In other words, learning. They want to make sense of the world around them. It's their world too. But you will catch no more than fleeting glimpses of this while they are immersed in a conventional learning environment. Carol Black elegantly describes this paradox in her article, A Thousand Rivers, What the Modern World Has Forgotten About Children and Learning. She writes, Collecting data on human learning based on children's behavior in school is like collecting data on killer whales based on their behavior at SeaWorld. The educational system's premise that memorized information and rote skills are the keys to success in our adult lives is beginning to crumble as we move further away from the industrial age that birthed it. The disconnect is growing more obvious every day. Young adults are no, no longer graduating into a world that mimics the school environment where they start at the bottom rung and climb the corporate ladder. Not only that... In the book, Ungifted, Intelligence Redefined, Scott Barry Kaufman weaves readers from the initial development of the IQ test through years of results and psychological studies, concluding that IQ tests show limited value in determining future success. He introduces his theory of personal intelligence, defining intelligence as the dynamic interplay of engagement and abilities in pursuit of personal goals. Nice. And by personal goals, he does not mean school grades in disguise. Though IQ tests continue to be po a popular tool for sorting and labeling students in the education system, in the end, Kaufman notes, as we've seen all throughout this book, when we look closely enough at people across a broad range of environments in which they are engaged and feel comfortable expressing themselves fully, we see these, quote, gifted characteristics in people all across the IQ spectrum. What I and many other unschooling parents have discovered is that unschooling shines at creating that safe and engaging environment in which children can flourish. That said, if you look around, you will find few quantitative studies done on unschoolers. 
There are a number of reasons for that, including unschooling children are a very small subset of the general student population. They don't typically participate in standardized testing. The results hold little value for unschooling parents because we don't subscribe to the standard learning timeline, meaning our children's knowledge and skills can vary widely from the age-based norm, and we're comfortable with that. And unschoolers aren't active consumers of education materials like packaged curricula, so there's not much money to be made by better understanding us. So at this point, you may be wondering, if I don't have quantitative proof of the efficacy of unschooling, what makes me think I have something of value to share with you? In her book, Rising Strong, Brene Brown shares a quote from an editorial written by Anne Hartman, Social Work, January 1990, and describes how it strongly influenced her career as a qualitative researcher. This editor takes the position that there are many truths and there are many ways of knowing. Each discovery contributes to our knowledge and each way of knowing deepens our understanding and adds another dimension to our view of the world. For example, large scale studies of trends in marriage today furnish helpful information about a rapidly changing social institution. But getting inside one marriage, as in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, richly displays the complexities of one marriage, leading us to new insights about the pain, the joys, the expectations, the disappointments, the intimacy, and the ultimate aloneness in relationships. Both the scientific and the artistic methods provide us with ways of knowing. And in fact, as Clifford Gertz has pointed out, innovative thinkers in many fields are blurring the genres, finding art in science and science in art and social theory in all human creation and activity. Brown went on to explain that, today I proudly call myself a researcher storyteller because I believe the most useful knowledge about human behavior is based on people's lived experiences. Reading both Hartman's and Brown's words made a strong connection for me with what I wanted to accomplish with this book. They added strength to my growing conviction that sharing the experiences of unschooling parents can add solid value to society's conversations surrounding children, learning, and parenting. It's why I love sharing the stories of many unschooling families from around the world through this podcast and sharing my own thoughts and experiences through my writing. Chapter 2, Our Parenting Mindset. Conventional wisdom has some very clear parenting messages, which we absorb early and often, so much so that it can be hard to imagine questioning them. Yet, as I began exploring and schooling, questions bubbled up. Rather than accepting those messages at face value, I chose to ponder the underlying assumptions and observations. Let's dig into the three significant paradigm shifts in my parenting mindset that emerged. Beyond 18. One of the first questions I pondered when I started out on this journey was this. Does parenting come with a deadline? That's certainly the conventional perspective. We are overjoyed to become parents, but it's not long before there's a big 18 flashing in the distance and urgent messages about starting college or university funds. The logic goes, once our child turns 18, they are no longer our legal responsibility. Check. (laughs) But soon we realize that also means they are no longer legally required to do what we tell them. Ah, there's no time to waste. Traditional parenting wisdom tells us we have an 18-year window to mold our children into competent adults or we have failed. That explains why parenting is such big business with glossy print magazines full of tips and tricks for managing your child at every age, after-school learning centers to augment and improve your child's academic standing, and extracurricular activities to round out their future college applications. Launching your freshly minted 18-year-old into a good college, preferably with their eyes set on a respectable career, has been the epitome of conventional parenting success. This 18-year narrative is so powerful that some governments are extending mandatory school attendance to age 18 to align themselves even more thoroughly. Childhood equals school. 
I live in Ontario, Canada, and Bill 52 did just that in 2006, raising the compulsory school age from 16 to 18, stating in the bill's preamble that the education system needs to instill in young people a lasting positive attitude towards learning that will keep them motivated to stay in school until they graduate or turn 18. (laughs) How is that working out? Well, the ubiquity of the story also means that many of us have experienced the challenges that can often result. Stress is high as parents work to help their children fit into the education system and motivate them to excel. It's stressful for the children too. By the time college or even high school graduation hits, many children have long lost their love for learning and are determined to never enter a classroom again. We have let the legal definition rule our lives. We love our children and don't want to fail at this important job, so we set our sights on that 18-year window and get to work, even at the expense of our relationships. Self-justification proliferates as we wield our parental power to insist our children follow along and keep up. We comfort ourselves with the rationale that we're doing it for their own good. We tell ourselves that once they're adults, they'll come to understand that we were right, and then we'll shift to a peer relationship. But how hard is it to change a relationship dynamic that's been 18 years in the making? The myriad of books and movies about the emotional turmoil that happens when adult children go home for the holidays might be a clue. That power and control-based relationship dynamic can be very difficult to shake. Is that the parenting destination we're aiming for? One of the fundamental paradigm shifts I made early in my unschooling journey came with the realization that we're building lifelong relationships with our children. (laughs) That seems an almost corny thing to say, but it's so easy to forget when we're caught up in the minutia of day-to-day life. Shifting my focus away from that 18-year deadline changed my perspective remarkably. The age of 18 is not a finish line, and parenting is not a race. Our relationships with our children last a lifetime. It hit me that if I wanted a less conventional and more engaged adult relationship with my children when they're grown, I needed a less conventional and more engaged relationship with them now. The time I invest in developing strong and connected relationships with my children today will pay interest over our lifetime. My three children are all over 18 now, and looking back, it's become clear that when we view parenting through this conventional 18-year window, we can make choices that, while they seem beneficial in the short term, are often detrimental to our children in the long term. By telling our children what to learn through curriculum, in the short term, we see them studying what we anticipate they should be learning. Great! But in the long term, they absorb the message that they don't need that they need others to tell them what to learn. Their curiosity fades. They don't pursue learning outside the classroom. By telling our children that the best way to learn is the teacher-student classroom model, in the short term, we see what looks like proof of learning through test results and report cards. But in the long term, they come to dislike the act of learning, often intensely, and they internalize the lesson that to learn, they must be taught by an expert. By using judgment and shame to shape our children's actions to fit our expectations, in the short term, we feel we're helping them learn how to behave within societal norms. But in the long term, we have suffocated their individuality and creativity. They learn to stay firmly inside the box. By always telling our children what to do, in the short term, we move through challenges as quickly and efficiently as we can muster, expecting them to remember for the next time. But in the long term, they have precious little problem-solving experience. They absorb the message that they aren't capable of figuring things out for themselves. They learn to trust others more than themselves. By insisting our children get along with their siblings in the name of family harmony and with their peers in the name of making friends, in the short term, we see them absorbing their discomfort and getting along with others. But in the long term, their self-awareness and empathy suffers. They learn not to trust their own feelings and find it difficult to understand the feelings and perspectives of others. 
How can it be that these well-intentioned parenting choices have such unintended long-term consequences? When we shift our parenting perspective from our children's first 18 years to their lifetime, the answers begin to emerge. Redefining success. To start looking at the bigger picture, let's dive deeper into your parenting mindset by asking, what does success look like to you? I followed the conventional paths of success to a T. Good grades, university degree, job at a big company, and I did it reasonably well by conventional standards with a university entrance scholarship, graduating on the dean's list from a combined engineering and business program, and straight to a nine to five engineering job at a large energy company. So what challenged me to rethink it all? First and foremost, my children. I've been observing them since they were born and have seen them learn so many things. I knew the depths of concentration and perseverance they would reach when engrossed in something. I knew their dispositions and personalities. And over the first few years of school, I saw those things change and not for the better. Another piece of the puzzle was meeting many other adults at work. Not eager to spend my working hours at a desk, I chose to work in the one engineering group based in the plant. In my first few years, I interacted with a wide variety of people. Day workers, ship workers, plant operators, shift supervisors, mechanical and electrical maintenance staff, materials supply staff, managers, system engineers, IT staff, financial analysts, directors, and the occasional VP. There was a definite hierarchy that closely aligned with the corporate structure, yet I came to realize that though society's conventional definition of intelligence links it to career trajectory, that wasn't what I was seeing in reality. The solid relationship between higher education, career trajectory, and happiness that I had swallowed hook, line, and sinker in school began to crack. I saw skilled and happy people in all jobs, and unmotivated and grumpy people too. I was drawn to those who enjoyed their work and chose to do it well. To me, that felt like success. And it seemed to have little to do with their job title and more to do with how well their work meshed with their personality, skills, and interests. As that sunk in more deeply, the corporate ladder began to lose its luster as a valid measure of success. Fred Rogers nails this in The World According to Mr. Rogers, Important Things to Remember. The thing I remember best about successful people I've met all through the years is their obvious delight in what they're doing, and it seems to have very little to do with worldly success. They just love what they're doing, and they love it in front of others. Now I had two observations at odds with what I thought I knew. My children weren't thriving in school, and though I had meticulously followed the established path to success laid out before me growing up, I wasn't seeing it play out as expected in my life. There was a disconnect somewhere. What was I missing? Looking for that answer led me to dig into the idea of success. So let's take a moment to look back at how we arrived here. The Industrial Revolution began in the late 1700s, marking the transition to machine-based manufacturing. The result was an industrial age where we saw huge economic gains as factories mechanized their production processes. In the early 1900s, the development of the assembly line brought us mass production. Extensive gains in efficiency were found through the breakdown and standardization of the production process, significantly lowering per-unit costs and encouraging even non-manufacturing industries to incorporate assembly line principles. Compulsory schooling laws began migrating across North America in the 1850s, and by the 1920s, the process was complete. Education became a business, and the efficient business model of the day, the assembly line, was front and center. Students were sorted by age, taught an increasingly standardized curriculum, and marched grade by grade through the system. In the 1950s, the digital revolution began with the advent of computers, picking up even more speed in, speed in the late 1970s when personal computers arrived on the scene. The ability to save, access, and manipulate large amounts of data shifted our economic fo focus from traditional industry to the digitization of information, the information age. 
Computerized systems like just-in-time inventory management afforded businesses another large jump in efficiency. Education systems also began to incorporate these digital tools with a growing reliance on multiple choice, fill-in-the-bubble tests for electronic marking, and large student databases to track courses taken, marks received, and college applications sent. Soon, quantitative measures became the standard by which almost everything was judged. If it couldn't be measured numerically for statistical analysis, it fell by the wayside. Even subjective feedback was now gathered on a scale of 1 to 10. And then, in the early 1990s, digital cell phones were developed and the internet hit critical mass. As more and more people have become connected through these networks, global communications have flourished. These connections are transforming our society, both our personal relationships and our working lives. As businesses are adjusting to this changing landscape, many are finding they want a new kind of employee. And now, here we sit, a century after its introduction, and the basic factory model of the education system remains basically unchanged. Students continue to mimic the assembly line nature of the conveyor, moving from class to class at the ring of the bell. Curriculum is the epitome of the breakdown and standardization of a product. In this case, a set of knowledge and skills that defines a competent adult that teachers are expected to deliver each time students enter their classrooms. But the important question remains, how successful is it from the student's point of view? School has become the filter through which we see almost everything. Children grow up being taught that a college or university education will pretty much guarantee them a good job that will in turn provide for their needs over our lifetime. Yet the landscape of work has changed significantly over the last couple of decades and the number of those stable and lucrative jobs is dwindling fast. Yet, still firmly planted in school's box, much of society continues to cling to the school-college-job paradigm, even in the face of this growing gap. With competition increasing for those remaining prized jobs, well-meaning parents start prepping their children for school well before they hit compulsory school age. Early childhood educators, health professionals, and well-meaning extended family members all measure young children against the yardstick of school readiness. The focus is not on a young child's unique needs and development, but on mastering the skills that will specifically help them fit into the school mold. Everything in a child's life is viewed through the lens of school before they even step foot in the building. And just to bring it home, what is the first question most adults ask any child they meet? What grade are you in? Even the seemingly innocuous conversation starter focuses not on their age, a marker of their lifetime, but on their grade, a marker of their school time. Again, it emphasizes to the child that school is the most important aspect of their life. School permeates family time as well. Homework is ubiquitous, evenings, weekends, and summers, requiring the parent to play the role of teacher. In the name of increased communication, some teachers send parents daily notes about their child's behavior and expect them to enforce discipline to the school's standards outside of school hours. School is presented by both teachers and parents as the child's work. You can do X when you've finished your homework, where X is any fun thing. Children quickly learn that work and fun are opposite. Even our everyday language is school-based. Play is now often described as an after-school activity or extracurricular activity, defined directly in contrast to school, creating a hierarchy in which play comes in a distant second. Free time outside of school has become less about the child exploring the world and more about how their activities will look on a college application. There is now barely a moment of childhood that is not pre-planned by an adult, overseen by an adult, and measured by an adult. School's influence is exhaustive, so much so that it's barely noticed. So it's not surprising that even after graduation, it's the environment adults instinctively seek out. It's their comfort zone. That good job with a cubicle, a desk, and a job document that details step-by-step what they need to do each day. The challenge is their comfort zone no longer meshes with the expansive landscape of our increasingly connected world. 
Seth Godin makes this point eloquently in The Icarus Deception, How High Will You Fly? As the industrial age has faded away and been replaced by the connection economy, the wide open reality of our new economic revolution, the fence has been dismantled. It's gone. But most of us have no idea that we're no longer fenced in. We've been so thoroughly brainwashed and intimidated and socialized that we stay huddled together, waiting for instructions, when we have the first, best, and once-in-a-lifetime chance to do something extraordinary instead. The disconnect between what young adults fresh out of school are taught to expect and what life in the real world is starting to ask of them continues to grow rapidly, with few signs that the titanic of an education system is going to be able to change course anytime soon. Yet, this is such an interesting and exciting time to be living. The pace of change has increased over the last few decades such that our lives look significantly different than even our parents' lives at our age, just one generation ago. That's unprecedented. There are big questions in the air and a budding sense of the connectedness of humanity. And I must say, it's pretty interesting reading that right now as we are in the middle of the pandemic, a long, long pandemic, (laughs) and so many things changing just over the last few years. But it's still an interesting and exciting time to be living. Okay, back. (laughs) So where did all that leave me? I saw that while an income that comfortably covers the necessities keeps day-to-day stress at bay, the higher salaries and more power inherent in climbing the corporate ladder don't seem to bring people more happiness. Doing work that meshed with a person's personality, skills, and interests seemed a more reliable barometer. They seemed more engaged with life in general and certainly seemed to enjoy their days more, regardless of the position of their job on the org chart. At the same time, I saw my children having fun and learning voraciously as they did things they enjoyed on weekends and during summer vacation. I realized that this was the engaged life I was envisioning for them. While at school, they seemed shackled and out of sorts. Society was telling me that I should be working to help them fit into school, instilling in them the importance of the good grades, college degree, respectable job trinity, and insisting they start early for best results. But I just couldn't do it. That engaged and joyful life was my goal for my whole family, children included. So I redefined success on my own terms, and in less than a year, I had left my job, discovered homeschooling, and shortly thereafter, unschooling, and pulled them out of school completely, much to their delight. Character development. As I mentioned earlier, in school, the focus is on developing cognitive skills, skills related to learning and measured on IQ tests, like recognizing numbers and letters, finding patterns, memory, and calculation skills. Yet, as Paul Tuff points out in How Children Succeed, a growing variety of researchers have produced evidence supporting what unschooling parents have discovered through experience. What matters most in a child's development is not mechanical learning, but the development of non-cognitive skills such as curiosity, self-awareness, empathy, and self-confidence. In short, character development. Development of themselves as an individual person, not as a repository of rote knowledge and skills. Albeit secondary to cognitive skill development, many schools have gotten into character development as well. Formal character education programs began to show up in North American schools in the 1990s. How have they been doing? Well, in October 2010, the Social and Character Development Research Consortium published a report titled Efficacy of School-Wide Programs to Promote Social and Character Development and Reduce Problem Behavior in Elementary School Children. The study followed students over three years, grades three to five, looking at seven different social and character development, SACD, programs in 84 schools, so 42 schools using a program and another 42 not using a program as a control group, and concluded that, quote, the analysis of the year-by-year impacts did not yield evidence that the seven SACD programs combined and individually improved student social and character development. Is that surprising? I don't think so. Character is not something you can effectively teach because traits are not like facts. They are personal characteristics, the ways in which we are inclined to act. 
Character is a spectrum of choices and not usefully boiled down to right or wrong, yes or no. Children may choose to act one way, say, when their parents or teachers are around, and another way when free among peers. The same as adults behaving differently around their boss. That's not character development, just behavior modification. Behavior modification is about the act, not the motivation. The what, not the why. Character development is about the why, the choices a person makes as they strive to be the person they want to be. Interestingly, this calls back to Popova's observation about information versus wisdom. Character is something we live. It develops over time as we choose our actions, tweak them as we gain more experience, all the while exploring the kind of person we want to be. Some traits we are born with, like curiosity, and they can be nurtured or discouraged by those around us. Others, like self-awareness and empathy, grow with experience, again, nourished or left to wither. Fed not through our words, but through our actions. The old adage, do as I say, not as I do, does not work. Children are as quick as adults to recognize the hypocrisy of that approach. How does this mesh with our longer-term perspective shift? The most significant impact is that we don't feel compelled to push our children to be all these things by age 18. That's the constraint that drives us to top-down control and behavior modification techniques. Almost paradoxically, unschooling parents have discovered that when we give our children the time, space, and support to explore the kind of person they want to be, we see character building in action every day. We see our children's choices developing naturally when they are actively engaged in their days. And with our growing self-awareness, we realize that we still wrestle with choices and character as adults. It's a process. Self-awareness can wax and wane depending on whether we are paying attention. My empathy grew considerably once I began unschooling, and I was challenged to see my children's world through their eyes rather than through my expectations. Creativity can grow when we manage to work through our fear of being judged by others, no matter our age, and our vision of the person and parent we want to be evolves over time. Instead of being taught that certain traits are good and this is the kind of person you should be, children who are able to explore these traits in a wide variety of situations learn their value to them. Like the value of being curious. Days are more interesting when they discover new things. The value of thinking creatively. They see more options as they move through their days. And the value of persistence, knowing through experience that they can eventually accomplish their goals if they keep at it. And so on. These traits need to be experienced, not put on posters. In fact, the classroom environment itself can have a negative effect on the development of a number of character traits. For example, it's hard to nurture curiosity when the teacher doesn't have the time to answer students' questions in the moment that they are curious, or creativity when they are expected to do things the one right way as outlined in the curriculum for full marks. Or persistence when the bell rings and students have to shift gears no matter how much they want to keep at it. Another aspect of the educational system that can be detrimental to character development is its attempt to mold students into one ideal graduate. And for character programs, the encouragement to be the, quote, most of whatever trait is the focus this month. The challenge is that we all have unique personalities and interests. We won't all hang out at the top of every trait, crazy, curious, super creative, doggedly persistent, and deeply empathetic. And that's okay. Developing the self-awareness to explore how these traits mesh with who we are and who we strive to be is much more valuable. So, if the view of parenting as an 18-year sprint to grow an adult is short-sighted, if the conventional wisdom about child development and the educational system's focus on cognitive skills is misguided, and if the typical classroom is not a safe and engaging environment where learning can flourish, where do we go? For me, the answer was unschooling. And we'll pick this back up next week. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the growing podcast archive. The conversations never go out of date. You can find more information about my books, 
the Living Joyfully Network online community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online course at my website, livingjoyfully.ca.